here we have Michael O'Connell. Uh, he has the event that we're doing now uh, called Now That We Have a Bull Market in Bitcoin, What Are We Going to Do? Uh, so Michael is the CEO of Watchdog Capital, an SEC-regulated FINRA member brokerage firm focused on the intersection of Bitcoin and securities. He has over 30 years of experience in the securities industry. He has been active in the Bitcoin space for seven years and has a unique view into how blockchain technology will revolutionize investing, capital raising, and personal freedom. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Michael, take it away. That was a pretty good bio. Who wrote that? <laughs> I don't think I saw that one before it went out. But uh, thank you very much, and thanks everybody for being here at 4.15 on a Friday. And I'm probably the only person standing between you and the bar at 5, so we will uh, have a good talk and then wrap this up in plenty of time. Yo, and I'm very happy to be here in New Hampshire. My wife grew up in Massachusetts. My family and I lived in Massachusetts for a long time. Uh, then we moved down to New York. But uh, very happy now to be saying that uh, I'm going to be moving up to Portsmouth, New Hampshire and be a Granite Stater. <laughs> so very much looking forward to that. Uh, you know, I've been working with Bruce Fenton at Watchdog Capital now for three years. So I come up, uh, I work out of Connecticut and I come up to Portsmouth more and more and on you know, a regular basis and you know, it's a great place to visit, it's a great place to work in, and you know, it looks like it's gonna be a really good place to live in as well. So, um, you know, I am CEO of Watchdog Capital, and we are a, so it's basically a stock brokerage firm, a FINRA member, SEC regulated investment firm. We're registered in all 50 states to do business as well as two territories. Um, you know, Bruce Fenton, founder of the firm, um, and obviously prominent Bitcoiner in the area and nationally. And, you know, Bruce and I's passion is really getting to the intersection of Bitcoin and securities, right? Bitcoin is the technology that will revolutionize everything, as, you know, as, as we all know. I mean, everybody here is a sound money proponent. And, you know, what I love coming around the exhibits here beforehand is just the amount of uh, vendors that take Bitcoin, the amount of people that think in sats, the amount of people that have Bitcoin pins on. I mean, that's a really, really good place to be. And I see, you know, that's one of the reasons to move here is I think, you know, New Hampshire is at the forefront of adopting Bitcoin on a wholesale basis. Right. So, um, you know, so what we do is we focus on that intersection of Bitcoin and securities. We look to introduce capital to companies that are Bitcoin related. Good enough? A little closer? How's that better? <laughs> so, companies that are uh, getting capital to companies that are Bitcoin related and really being proponents of tokenization of securities and tokenization of assets. So, my background I've been around the securities and derivatives business for about 30 years, um, and I've been in various different roles for the first. 10 years of my career, I was a bond salesman. So from 1990 to 2000, I was a government bond salesman. So, you know, for 10 years every day, I was very, very attuned to what was going on in monetary policy, what was going on in the Fed, what was going on with money supply and budget deficits and legislature that would control the budget deficit. And uh, from there, I was in other roles. I was at State Street Bank for about 10 years. I launched two different uh, electronic trading platforms there. I was at the Royal Bank of Scotland for a time, doing, uh, uh, working on the derivatives desk there. So uh, I got hooked up with Bruce about three years ago as we were getting Watchdog Capital off the ground. And you know, what first got me interested in Bitcoin was just living in that world of budget deficits and legislation and government borrowing for so long, right? And, you know, I really, really got interested in Bitcoin, you know, after Lehman 2008, 2009, you know, and the zero interest rate policy that followed after that, you know, and having 
seeing such a radical change in U.S. monetary policy at that point in time just told me, I mean, there's just no way this is going to end well. Um, you, know, you know, I can remember, a lot of people remember a time when elected officials in this country actually were really, really concerned about budget deficits. They were really, really concerned about governments borrowing money. You know, there were senators and congressmen who would vote against any budgets that required increased borrowing by the government. You know, there were, um, you know, there was legislation passed to prevent increases in government borrowing. And, you know, there was a very hard line of people who just did not want the government to borrow more money. And post 2008, 2009, we've seen the exact opposite. And, you know, what I see Bitcoin is a you know, an asset that the market has selected to become a global means of exchange that everybody can use and it can't be debased by government activity, right? So bottom line, that's where I come to when I'm looking at Bitcoin. And, you know, it's a really, really fascinating asset in a lot of ways, right? Because when you think of it as a trading asset, it is, it's as volatile as, as anything you could possibly want to trade. So if you're looking for volatility, you've got all the volatility you could ever want you know, on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. Um, but it's also, in my mind, very much a predictor of the market's expectations of future interest rate increases and decreases and future rates of either inflation increases or decreases. And then on top of that, you know, Bitcoin really trades like an emerging market. You know, and the price action you see in Bitcoin from its very start up until now mimics, you know, the price action curve that you'd see on any emerging market asset, right? So when you think about an emerging market that has gone mainstream, um, you can think of things like the Pacific Rim in the 90s. You can think about the tech stock and dot-com markets um, from, you know, mid-1990s till today, right? And then, you know, you can see Bitcoin in that as well, right? Um, you know, the trend with an emerging market is there's a new technology developed, there's a new market that's opened, and investors start to notice it and they start piling in because they're seeing expectations of big future returns. So as investors pile in and the prices go higher, eventually asset prices go high enough to where they don't make sense versus valuation of future earnings or, you know, or any other measure of value. So the market sells off, it falls out of favor, and the marketplace sits in that trough of despair for a while until the asset comes back into favor and people start buying it again. So what you see over time in these successful emerging markets is a pattern where the asset rallies, it goes to a higher high each time, and then when it falls into a bull market, a bear market, sorry, it also comes, it also ends up at a higher low than it was in the previous cycle. So as you go along in that emerging market cycle and the highs get higher and the lows get higher, you're really at the point where the emerging market has become you know, adopted and almost mainstream, if not actually mainstream, right? And you can see that in, you know, some of the Bitcoin price action from inception, right? So when you, you know, you start with Bitcoin at zero in 2009, 2010, by the time you got to 2014, early 2014, it was $900 a coin. And then price dropped back down and by, where were we here? Beginning of 2016, Bitcoin was actually trading at $450 at the beginning of 2016, right? And from there, it rallied up to almost 17,000 by the end of 2017. And then back down again, but the, again to a higher low. So 3,700 is where Bitcoin hit their low, hit the low of December 2018. And then from there, rallied up to 61,000 in April of 2021, right? And then the last low, if you look back at the last low was the beginning of 2023, January 2023, you're looking at price somewhere around $17,000. And now obviously you're up to 70,000 
today. So that, that pattern of higher highs and higher lows has really been so prominent with this asset that you, know, you can think of it on that one step as an emerging market, and I think that's pretty cool. Um, the, other, uh, the other really interesting thing about Bitcoin, in my belief, is that it's a very good predictor of the market's expectations for future interest rate levels and future levels of inflation, right? And you've seen a trend over the last few years where Bitcoin prices rise in anticipation of money printing and lower rates, and Bitcoin prices fall in anticipation of Fed tightening and a smaller money supply, right? And you can look back to a couple examples. Um, the, at the very end of 2019 was one of the first large-scale institutional Bitcoin trades that was done as specifically as a hedge against inflation. So there was a man called Eric Peters at One River Asset Management right down in Stanford, Connecticut, where I live now. Uh, he's a hard money proponent for a long time. And he bought $600 million worth of Bitcoin in the fall of 2019, right around $7,000 a coin. And at that point in time, he was anticipating a much slower economy for 2020, Fed easing, and you know, the accompanying of inflation that eventually goes with it. So you know, he did, obviously didn't realize that he was getting into the, the very early days of COVID and the lockdown and the, the, the astonishing money printing that followed after that. So by the fall of 2020, that trade had doubled in value. So that was a $600 million gain in under a year with a Bitcoin inflationary hedge trade. And that's absolutely fascinating, right? And you see, I think, the exact opposite of that you know, with uh, the move down as you started hearing about planned Fed hikes at the end of 2021. So mid-November of 2021, you started seeing in the financial press talk about, uh, about the Fed uh, the Fed raising rates, rate of money's printing would, uh, would slow down, and um, <laughs> so Fed is raising rates, money printing slows down, and Bitcoin would then fall, right? So Bitcoin in March, so Bitcoin mid-November 2021 is trading 71,000. And by the time the Fed did their actual first tightening in March of 2022, Bitcoin was already down uh, 40%. So you went from 71 to 42 in that period of time, just with, I think, the market predicting that there were tighter rates ahead and Bitcoin wouldn't be as attractive an asset as time went on, right? And... Two months later, beginning of May, they did their second hike, and Bitcoin was down another 15% to about 35,000 right at that point. You know, and then at that point, three days later, Terra Luna blew up, and all of the predictive value uh, seemed to go away out of that market for a while. But uh, you know, I do think you've seen that reflected very recently at the start of the rally that we're in now, right? So. I look back and I call the start of this current rally as about the middle of back uh, the middle of September 2023, so back in the fall. So the last Fed tightening had been in July, um, and in that September period, you started seeing the first stories in the news about speculation of 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 looser money, of the Fed easing in 2024. And I think Bitcoin jumped right on that and started rallying because you saw Bitcoin rally all the way through September, October. So by the middle of November, you had Bitcoin at 38,000, right? So that was up 54% from September just on the anticipation of inflation news and easier money policy ahead. Uh, but then the really cool thing that happened was the announcement of the Bitcoin ETF, Right. And again, you started seeing the news stories about the anticipation of Bitcoin ETF approval starting in right around that mid-November time frame. So 
mid-November, stories were coming out about that, and the asset started rallying, you know, all the way up into January 10th. So January 10th was the day that the Bitcoin ETF was approved, and at that point, you saw Bitcoin 47,000 on January 10th as the ETF was approved. Yeah, and the ETF, to me, is probably the most important thing that's happened in the history of Bitcoin. And, you know, ETF stands for an exchange traded fund. And, you know, an exchange traded fund is a really simple concept. It's a mutual fund that you can invest in, and you can buy the shares of that mutual fund on a stock exchange. Uh, so just like any mutual fund, when you buy shares of an ETF, you're buying shares in a company that owns some sort of underlying asset. So if you buy, say, an S&P 500 index mutual fund, your, your ETF, you're buying an ownership in the company that owns all the underlying shares of the S&P 500. So if you invest in a Bitcoin ETF, what you're investing in is a trust that owns Bitcoin directly. So as you put a dollar into that ETF, then the ETF, the trust, has to go buy a dollar's worth of Bitcoin. And you know, with that buying power alone, what you've seen now is you know, Bitcoin, where, where were we this afternoon? Somewhere 69, 70, something like that? I hadn't checked it before I came in here. But I mean, that's, a, you know, that's up 90% from mid-September. I'm sorry, that's up, it's up almost 300% in mid-September. And, um, you know, it's, a, it's an astonishing thing. Did anybody in, anybody in the room get involved in the Bitcoin ETF at all? And I imagine everybody else is probably owning the actual Bitcoin itself. <laughs> yeah, okay, so, yeah, so that's about a 300% rally in three months' time. Um, you know, Another thing that I've found was actually really interesting about this particular rally has been kind of a demonstration of what uh, we've called the Thanksgiving dinner table trade. Um, and you saw this phenomenon in a couple of different markets over time. But yeah, when Bitcoin made that run from about 7,000 to high 17,000 right in the middle of December, so November to, to December of 2017, Bitcoin ran from seven to seventeen, or from seven thousand to seventeen thousand, in that period of time, and we were calling that the Thanksgiving dinner table trade. Right, Bitcoin was rallying all year long, and if you were long Bitcoin that year and you went to Thanksgiving dinner, that was pretty much all you could talk about was Bitcoin and how well Bitcoin had done and you know how rich this is going to make me and you know how great this is. And I think that was one of the first real mainstream notice of Bitcoin was that particular period of time because all of a sudden there was a lot more in the press about it. People were talking about it. People knew that Bitcoin had run from seven to 17,000. And you know, that kind of Thanksgiving table trade, I mean, it, it's completely unscientific and, you know, and probably wouldn't be proven out anywhere, but you, know, you do see that pattern of people getting together and deciding that this is a good asset and at certain points in time and they go away and buy it. I mean, the, the Thanksgiving table trade, you saw that in Beanie Babies in 1998. You saw it in tech stocks in 1999, subprime mortgages in 2004, um, even 2008 with the usage of Facebook. That year, uh, December of 2008, was one of the biggest years of Facebook adding users because, again, everybody had sat around the Thanksgiving table, realized they had to get on Facebook, and went home and created an account. Right? So, you, know, you probably, I'm sure that we saw the, the Thanksgiving effect come into the last upleg of this rally as well. So, you know, where's that put us now? Right? So, Bitcoin market cap right now is 1.4 trillion. So the value of all the Bitcoin in existence right now is 1.4 trillion dollars. So right now that's bigger than market cap of 
Facebook and it's bigger than the market cap of uh, Berkshire Hathaway. And it's sitting just behind Google and um, uh, and about a trillion, another trillion dollars behind Apple at this point. But uh, you know, the fact that you see a market cap up that high is just spectacular at this point. You know, and you know, the, you know, now the big, you know, with the big event of ETF approval, you know, that's the next big leg, I think, upward for this market, right? Because this is the, this is real mainstream acceptance of Bitcoin as a legitimate asset. And, you know, the great thing about the ETFs is that they've made it really easy for people to buy Bitcoin who are not tech savvy, who are very uncomfortable with acting as their own bank, but they want that access to the price movement of Bitcoin. So, you know, the great thing about being able to buy a Bitcoin ETF is it takes those hurdles out of the way, right? So you don't have to have a wallet. You know, anybody who's trying to educate themselves about Bitcoin and learn about Bitcoin, the first article they read when they're educating themselves talks about the person who lost their keys and lost all their crypto, right? So being able to eliminate the need for a wallet makes that asset you know, much more attractive at that point. And then after that, you're able to actually buy it, the Bitcoin ETF, right out of a brokerage account where you already have other money that you're investing in other asset classes. So it makes it very easy for cash to flow into that market. So you can, you can have your account at Fidelity or Charles Schwab or Merrill, and you can decide that you want to put X amount of dollars into the Bitcoin ETF for your taxable accounts and for your 401k and your IRA. All the registered investment advisors at those firms, they can recommend that their customers all have an allocation of Bitcoin in their securities portfolio, and they can do that through the ETF. You know, and that sort of opportunity, you know, it just brings the cash inflows into the ETFs. I mean, um, the number is probably bigger today, but two days ago, since January 10th approval of the ETFs, there was $30 billion that flowed into Bitcoin ETFs. So that was $30 billion worth of Bitcoin removed from the market in that period of time to sit in those funds. And you know, when a trust buys something like Bitcoin, a lot of those coins are going to Bitcoin heaven. You know, they'll, they'll probably never come out into the market again, a large percentage of those coins, uh, because the holding period for the typical average holding period for an ETF is about 18 months. And where Bitcoin is such a long-term hold of an asset, you know, you could be very confident that there's not going to be, you know, there's not going to be a lot of Bitcoin that actually gets sold out of ETFs. Incoming, you know, people with incoming money would probably replace the money that's coming out when people are redeeming at any given point in time. So from a supply and demand standpoint for Bitcoin going forward, you know, you're looking at uh, you know, a really, really good story for what the price could look like. Um, uh, I read an article on Coindesk yesterday, and they were calling for, uh, over the next three years, inflows of $220 billion to Bitcoin ETFs on top of what's already gone in there now. So from a buying perspective, you know, this, is, this is such a great event for Bitcoin, right? And you know, that kind of brings me back to what I was, you know, kind of the theme of the talk, which is, right, um, you know, what do we do with this now? You know, we've, we've got a Bitcoin bull market. You know, a lot of people are a lot richer and a lot more people are learning about Bitcoin through the ETFs. You know, what do we do now? You know, and so I think it's very important that as new people come into Bitcoin, especially via the ETF, you know, there's a big effort to educate those people and help them learn more about the asset. Um, because once anybody gets involved in Bitcoin that I've ever known, you know, once they start exploring it and they really understand what it's all about, then they really will go and get their own wallet. They'll put their money into Bitcoin and they'll start 
buying as much Bitcoin as possible, physical Bitcoin, because that's really the, you know, that's really where they're going to get the benefits from it. Right. And that's what I tell people all the time who are buying the ETF is, you know, it's great that you're buying the ETF, you're getting exposure to the price of Bitcoin, but it's not Bitcoin, right? Not your keys, not your Bitcoin is the saying that everybody knows. So if you own paper Bitcoin in the form of an ETF or even a Bitcoin that you're holding on an exchange, I tell those people you're just not getting the benefit of that hard money that you should be, right? So that's the big thing that uh, we're focused on is educating people about real Bitcoin and how they should be involved in it. And you know, it's really cool coming up here because I've talked to people around here uh, just this afternoon and you know, there's real estate that's being bought and sold with Bitcoin. There's apartments that are being rented for Bitcoin. Um, there's all, biz all different businesses accepting Bitcoin for payment. Uh, there's people who are living their lives denominated in sats. And they only get they only pay they only pay for things and they only get paid for things in Sats and I think that's a you know just a really really powerful way of life that really backs up the potential of Bitcoin as Satoshi thought about it. So you know yeah you know, I can take some questions now if you want, but you know that's about the uh, you know, that's about the extent of what I think really should be the focus as we go along here is educating people to really use Bitcoin as Bitcoin. A lot of people who I know that are interested, who are interested in Bitcoin or cryptocurrency in general are do, doing so for their interest in the privacy of it. What recommendations might you have to encourage people to invest in any cryptocurrency but also able to maintain their privacy? Yeah, I mean, that's the, uh, that's the struggle now with the rises of exchanges is it obviously makes it easier to buy Bitcoin, put, have it on the exchange, send your money to the exchange, and then send the coin to your wallet. But obviously, you've gone through an email KYC process and a, and a wallet vetting process at that point as well. So, you know, from there, you know, the, you know, if that's what you're looking for in that privacy standpoint, really, the solution would be you know, something of more of a private purchase and sale and a wallet-to-wallet -wallet type peer-to-peer -peer situation. Okay. So I think the name of your talk, right, was, uh, you know, we're in a bull market, what do we do? And I thought maybe you'd be like more like, you know, you're, you're talking about advocacy, but um, when I saw the name of the talk, something that came to my mind was, um, in one of Ayn Rand's novels, the phrase that um, I don't build to make money, I make money to build. And so I thought you might talk about, you know, what do we do with this wealth? You know, once you have it, like what are you building in your life? Where are you gonna put it? And just curious what, if you have thoughts on that kind of topic of, you know, it's not, it doesn't really do anything for us sitting on a, on a blockchain other than- No, you know, no, you're right. Help, help us create this free future, but um, at some point, you know, like, like all the value you, uh, the wealth you collect in your life, you know, maybe you want to pass it on to your next generation. But for the most part, I want to do something with it today, fulfill my own visions and your thoughts on that. Yeah, there's, uh, you know, I've, I've got a couple things going that uh, I work on from, you know, just a personal family standpoint and then, you know, looking bigger picture around the world as well, right? Um, um, you know, just from, from a family standpoint, you know, I've got a piece of property that uh, has a couple of rooms that get rented for Bitcoin. And that's coin that goes to future grandchildren college education somewhere, right? Um, and probably about, you know, that's probably one of about the simple, most basic uses that you talked about of, you know, how we're going to do something with this. Uh, the other piece of it is um, an effort I'm just starting to get involved in with different people. And this is around getting to different countries that are light in traditional natural resources, but heavy in natural resources that help build the crypto world, right? El Salvador, Iceland, you know, any countries that have geothermal power, 
but no plants to take advantage of it, you know, those countries can be legitimate world powers in the age of digital money because they have energy that they can use with the right capital investment to set up a mine and mine Bitcoin, mine crypto, put that money in your national treasury and actually become a significant world power using natural resources that didn't mean anything in a traditional economy, you know, 50 years ago. So those are, you know, that's, that's kind of the, you know, that, that sort of building, it's in the very early stages. We've had some discussions with, with various parties about, you know, how we can work with different areas and, and arrange financing for that. But, uh, you know, and that's a pretty wild disparity of, you know, projects to get involved in. But, um, but it's interesting and, you know, it's something that really could make a difference down the road. Where do you keep your, you know, so you have your Bitcoin on a wallet now. Well, we could, uh, yeah, I think that goes, uh, a lot of that goes back to the privacy standpoint. How private do you want that transaction to be? Oh, it's only 10 grand, so I don't care about taxes. <laughs> right, from a, I'm thinking about it more from a privacy perspective. Right, so if you buy, if you go to an exchange and you're buying or selling crypto, any Bitcoin on an exchange, you can set up an account there and you can connect your wallet to that so that you would transfer your Bitcoin from your personal wallet to the exchange wallet. But in order to do that, you're going to go through an AML KYC process where they take a picture of your driver's license, collect your personal information and vet you against the various you know, anti-terrorists and anti-money laundering lists that are out there. So if you wanted to do that type of sale, you know, you could do it certainly by connecting your personal wallet to an exchange, but you do run through the privacy issues of trading on an exchange. So does it matter which exchange? They're, they're all going to give me the current price, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, I've heard really good things about crypto.com, so... I think uh, yeah, well, that would be a great place to go. Um, you know, beyond that, there's there's Coinbase and there's Kraken. But um, you know, I've been a I've been a, a, a favorite of Crypto.com. This is not a shill by any means, but uh, you know, for somebody in your position that's looking to do that, uh, I'm a big fan. I'd recommend to you uh, River.com, which is a Bitcoin-only exchange. They do they make Bitcoin functionality that other exchanges don't do because they're so busy onboarding all the other coins. Um, anyway, the, in terms of what's next, the general thesis that I have is kind of in line with the idea of the network state. This is a book by Balaji, and t it's talking about using technology and real estate to build community and to, to, build, to, to manifest what we've been building in the digital realm more meaningfully in the, in the physical realm. And so on the, on the property development side, that means uh, acquiring real estate and having some means of uh, sharing it out or having uh, involving other people in that that real estate and on the technology side it means building tools around um, reputation and and group decision making to support doing things uh, having these collaborative efforts yeah. right more questions? Uh, when you say that the ETF was one of the best things to happen to Bitcoin, you seem confident in that answer, but how do you know that the game wouldn't have played out where, um, or it was the adoption into the legacy institutions just forestalled the ultimate collapse and the rise of the new uh, financial institutions for the future? Um, yeah, that's basically. Yeah, you know, it, uh, what I, the better way to phrase that would be um, probably the best thing to happen for the price of Bitcoin so far in the history of Bitcoin, right? And you, know, and you make a great point because, you know, there is another scenario with the Bitcoin ETF that looks kind of ugly, right? You know, if you saw, if you extrapolated forward all those cash inflows to 
ETFs, and for some reason, lots, you know, a huge percentage of people bought the ETF, you could end up with most of the supply of Bitcoin in the hands of two or three large custodian banks. And at that point, the financial system has effectively captured Bitcoin and really could effectively do whatever they wanted to do with it, right? And then from there, you could have a, you could end up in a, a, a Bitcoin market with multiple tiers, right? You could have a AML KYC Bitcoin market where wallets could only be trading with each other if both of them had already been AML KYC'd and, that, and the price of that Bitcoin could be a different price than a peer-to-peer -peer wallet exchange where you know, there's no authority seeing identities about anybody, right? And you know, the, you know, to your point, there, you, know, you, could, you could run lots of different scenarios up against that. So you know, I do think from where we are now, just the, from a price standpoint, this is a, without a doubt the, the best thing that's happened so far. Anybody else? Hmm. Yeah. Um, if you could fast forward to what the next big dip or crash, um, is, is Bitcoin getting more stable in price as its larger in value? Or can we expect you know, an 8% correction at some point? And then, you know, what, what does it look like to you at that point? Maybe two years from now or whatever it happens. Well, if you, if you look for, so based on what we talked about here now, you know, I think if you're looking for a, a cause of the bear market, of the next bear market in Bitcoin, you know, it could very well be you know, the start of the next tightening cycle 18 months down the road, right? If we're in, a, if we're in the, the very beginning of an easing cycle right now, if that ease cycle it runs you know, from a historical basis, then you know, 18 months from now, we could be talking about the Fed tightening rates. And at that point, if Bitcoin is the inflationary hedge that we think it is, that could be the start of a downtrade, right? So um, you know, your point about as, you know, the, the price going up, but the volatility being more stable, you know, I think I think you do have the possibility as the price goes up and more bitcoins are taken by the ETFs and taken completely out of the market, you can have a mark, you know, bitcoin market that is still really really illiquid because there's just not enough coins to go around. And, you know, there could be you know, there could be 10 buyers at one price level and the price should be going up, but no coins have appeared to sell to any one of those 10 buyers, right? So, you know, I think as more coins are, sorry? Wouldn't that just make the price go up? I think it would make the price go up. It would certainly make the price go up, but the, the volatility and the ease of trading in and out of those positions starts to become more difficult. I, um, I haven't read the prospectus on the ETFs yet, but are they allowed to short sell on the way down? No. Okay. No, they would have to, uh, any ETF, any trust owned by an ETF, uh, unless it specifically says it in the prospectus, isn't allowed to be short any particular market. And when they buy it, are they obligated to like have it in custody or are they allowed to like lend it out? Uh, they buy it and they hold it in custody and it has to sit in custody. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I mean the the whole payment the whole payment business I think has been very disappointing for the venture capitalists who backed all the projects because the I think uh, you know, the the widespread adoption of Lightning nodes coincided with the bear market and I think there was less outright spending of Bitcoin at that point in time over the network. Um, I think on top of that, there's too many providers right now. Uh, between Liquid 
in Lightning. There's too many different companies that are competing for that same marketplace. So I, I think a combination. Of, I, I think what you'd see is a combination of fewer Lightning projects, different projects merge, and you know maybe some of the two, maybe some of the aspects of, of some of those businesses merge together. You know there could be a company that runs Liquid and Lightning, and you know figures out some sort of uh, synergies between those you know those platforms and their customers. Anybody else? Well, it's five minutes to five, so like I said, I got you out right before the bar opened. So thank you very much for coming. Appreciate it.